Now, if you remember what I've covered in previous lessons, see what I did there? Then you would know that there are various ways that we understand how memory works. We discussed the multi-store model of memory by Atkinson and Schifrin, the working memory model by Baddeley and Hitch, and in this lesson, we're looking at the levels of processing model of memory by Craig and Lockhart. So what's the diagram for this one? What does this one look like? Well, something like this. Okay, I'm being a little bit cheeky here. There isn't really a flowchart that describes the levels of processing model. I do have a definition for you though, and it's this. It's a model of memory that suggests that memory comprises a continuous dimension in which memory is encoded related to the ease with which it can be retrieved. The deeper the processing of information, the greater the chance of it being retrieved. Well, that's self-explanatory, roll credits. Sometimes it can hurt you out. All right, so what this is trying to say in English is that, well, there isn't a diagram because it's not really about storage spaces. The level of processing model suggests that memory isn't really about like separate memory stores, but simply that the deeper you process something, the greater the chance of it being remembered and retrieved. Now, there are three levels of encoding, shallow, moderate, and semantic. But first, let me introduce you to an incredible person called Pratik Yadav. Hailing from India, Pratik is an international grandmaster in memory sports. Among his many achievements are these. He has officially successfully memorized 1,089 digits in 5 minutes, 340 playing cards in 10 minutes, and 335 different random words in 15 minutes. That's like more than one word every three seconds. It's crazy. Now there are many methods that memory athletes like Pratik use, but they almost all involve deeper levels of processing that allow fast but very effective remembering. Time for some examples. Here are 51 words. Do you reckon it's possible to memorize them all? Well, yes, if you're Pratik, <laughs> but for us, Let's just focus on, say, the first seven words. How might we try to memorize these? Well, we might notice, for example, that all seven words have an R in them. Carve, narrow, worm, straw, rigid, hilarious, and hammer. So once again, we're gonna use the letter R as a common thread to sort of bind all these words together. One more time. Carve, <laughs> narrow, worm, straw, rigid, hilarious, and hammer. All right, hopefully you've tried to commend that to memory. And before I get you to repeat it back to me, here's a little activity that I'm gonna give you 15 seconds to do. Go ahead. And just in case you care, here are the answers, but more importantly, do you remember what those seven words were? Remember the letter R was a common theme. Have a go saying them. Chances are you got some of those words, maybe most of them, but it was probably a bit hard to recall. And that's because the type of processing that we use to memorize those words would be best described as shallow. We actually use a structural type of encoding, which is remembering something based on like its features. In this case, because we're using the words, physical features like upper or lower case, or for us, the letter R. Okay, that was level one. Let's go a little bit deeper. Let's look now at these words over here. How can we memorize these seven words? Well, one thing you might notice <laughs> by pure coincidence is that all the words are two syllables and they all rhyme. Flimsy, husky, nighty, spooky, wriggly, nappy, and chirpy. Once again, flimsy, husky, nighty, spooky, wriggly, nappy, and chirpy. Just like the last time, I've got an activity for you to do for 15 seconds, and then we'll test your memory. Okay, I was a teeny bit mean this time. There's actually only six differences. Just hit seven to keep you guessing. But more importantly, what were the seven words? Remember, they're all two syllables and they rhyme with that E sound at the end. Try saying them out again. So because we went a little bit deeper with our processing, hopefully you were able to remember more words this time. Psychologists describe this type of encoding as phonemic, and this would be considered a moderate level of processing. Because it's gone a little bit deeper than that first level, you should have been able to remember a little bit more. Now we go to the third and deepest level of processing called a semantic, which means meaning. How does that work? Well, let me show you. We're gonna focus on these middle seven words on the screen and try and memorize them, not based on structural similarities or you know, how they sound, but what they actually mean. 
So I'm going to combine those first two words, soft eagle, and I'm going to see in my mind, I'm going to attach meaning to it. I'm going to see a, a soft eagle, literally, like a, a, a plush, soft stuffed toy. Next, I'm going to take symmetry and park uh, and make it a, a car park next to a symmetry. So I've got a soft eagle, this toy that's flying over a car park next to a cemetery. For the next two words, I'm gonna have a gate with really sharp tips so that a receipt can be sort of like punctured onto the top. And then I'm gonna have a really large ladybug, a really cute one, trying to pull that receipt off the top. So soft eagle flying above a car park next to a cemetery, a receipt that's been like stabbed onto the top of this gate with a ladybug trying to pull it off. And just like the last time, 15 seconds to do this. Those are the answers, though literally no one cares, but based on the meaning and on what you visualized before, can you remember those seven words? Soft Eagle, Park Symmetry, Gate, Receipt, Ladybug. Now I'm not sure how you were able to do it just then, but for me, remembering those seven words this time was super easy. And it's because the type of processing that was used is what we would call deep processing. We were using semantic encoding, which is when words are encoded by their meaning, which allows us to place them directly into our meaning networks in our brain, semantic networks. And this in a nutshell is the LOP or levels of processing model of memory. Now there are a couple of extra interesting things to take note of that were discovered with later research. One was a conclusion made by Tyler and colleagues in 1979, whereby it was found that the more effort that's needed to have to encode or try to remember something, the stronger the recall is. So Tyler gave participants easy and hard anagrams to try and remember, and counterintuitively, the harder ones were more often recalled because participants probably had to work harder to try and encode and remember it. It's pretty fascinating. The second discovery was that if information was related back to yourself, or to someone or something uh, that you know or care about a lot, it also improves memory. In other words, if you were able to make some sort of personal connection with what you were trying to remember, you were a lot more likely to recall it. Now, this is really interesting stuff to learn in psychology, but personally, I think it's got implications that go farther than that. I'll leave you with two questions that I really want you to think about. The first one is this. How might the level of processing model help you study better? You know, everything that we just talked about, about trying to deepen your processing, working hard to encode, even trying to relate it to yourself. How might that help you study better? And the second question is, how might the level of processing model help you remember just important things in your life better? There are so many things that compete for our attention and our memory. And if this could help you, I don't know, become a better person, why not? All right, that concludes this second extra model of memory. I hope this lesson stays with you and that you can remember it in the years to come. See you later. <laughs>